Kitty here welcome back to my channel today's video is a let's talk about it video and this is Disney fan theories part 12 and this time we're doing finding Nemo and finding Dory so the first theory is Bruce from finding Nemo is the son of the shark from Jaws there's not much to the theory itself but here are a few things I've noticed on the set of Jaws, they had multiple shark models for filming. All of them were named Bruce after Spielberg's lawyer. This could be more than just an homage to the film Jaws. Bruce could be named after his father. Bruce in Finding Nemo never knew his father. It's possible he could have been closer to his mother. In fact, apparently it's fairly common for great whites to leave their infant children behind since they can't swim at birth. Bruce in Finding Nemo has a support group of sharks where their entire mantra goes against being mindless killing machines. Maybe because his mother told him about how monstrous his father was? Even by great white standards, we don't know why Bruce formed a support group like this. It could be that he's avoiding trying to be like his dad. There's another homage to Jaws in the chase scene from Finding Nemo. Dory and Marlin drop, launch a torpedo into Bruce's mouth in a similar fashion. And then the TLDR says Bruce from Jaws had a child with a female shark but left because he wanted to terrorize humans. Distraught that her mate was a total monster, she tried to raise Bruce Jr. to be kind-hearted before eventually leaving him on his own or dying. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this is a believable one. I really don't think it is. No. No, I, I don't think it's very believable, to be quite honest. I think it's just they took little pieces of Jaws and used it in Finding Nemo. I don't think there's like a, any like familiarity. In Finding Nemo, Coral, Coral didn't actually die to the Barracuda and Marlin was knocked out. I know this seems like denial, which it most likely is, to a character we only know for two minutes. But for years, I always thought to myself that Coral didn't die protecting her children and, like Marlin in the tail end of her consciousness, witnessed the predator eating her kids. So why isn't she there to comfort Marlin or wake him up in the safety of his anemone? The guess is that in a mixture of grief of being able to protect her children and feeling like she let herself down as a lover to Marlin and, and a parent, from this she leaves in the dead of the night never to return. If she were to stay with Marlin, she'd have to live with the fact that her children dying was all her fault, seeing Marlin as a reminder of that loss, projecting herself more of a burden than anything. Um, I don't know. I mean, in a perfect world, Nemo would have a mom, right? But we all know this, that this is Disney, and yes, it's Disney Pixar, but this is Disney, and moms don't survive in Disney movies at all. <laughs> Barely ever. And, um... You know, in the newer movies, the moms sometimes make it, but this was back in the early 2000s where the moms didn't make it in Disney movies. Um, so yeah, I don't think that it's a possibility that Coral is alive. I think it's very probable that she is dead. The next theory is called The Truth Behind the Shark's Vegetarianism. The other day I was watching Finding Nemo again because do I really need a reason? Anyway, one line from the movie really stuck out to me. Humans think they own everything, probably American. We will get back to that later. Another thing that has always stuck out to me as odd about that movie was how there was vegetarian sharks. Those really don't exist in real life. All sharks eat fish, especially the species they chose to represent in the movie. Great whites, hammerheads, and mako sharks are all pretty carnivorous. Pretty much all cases of vegetarianism that don't stem from taste or allergies are caused by a dr drastic realization. 
And remember that these are sharks, not humans, so they'd be even harder to push over the edge. My theory is that they came to a realization that fish are not the enemy and the true enemies are humans. Give that a moment to sink in. Um, actually, that was not super shocking, but trust me, it gets better. Let's look over the evidence, shall we? There's that line from Chum I mentioned earlier. Sharks don't nest in sunken boat boats like they do in the movie. So it could be them saying, take that, bitches. Also, let me draw your attention to how Chum has a fishing hook nose ring, which according to his Pixar wiki wik page, he got from a tussle with a fisherman. So he probably did this for the same reason that they live in a sunken submarine. But why would they come to this realization? We know that this should have been caused by a drastic event, so what was the event? Well, I think that they were imprisoned by the Marine Life Institute. Joey, that really sounds like something you just pulled out of your ass. Well, other, well, other me, I have more to back this up than just that. I know to back my theories up with lots of evidence. I'm not screen rant. First off, they don't really like they really don't like dolphins and there's not many dolphins in the coral sea where the movie takes place so how would they know enough about dolphins to formulate a strong opinion about them because they're from america that's why also that line from anchor i mentioned earlier you might be wondering how they could have gotten into the institute because you apparently need a handicap to get in well they do kind of have one considering how out of whack their body proportions are seriously look at a Look at a picture of Anchor compared to a real hammerhead shark and you'll know what I'm talking about. So I hope you enjoyed that and that you learned something today. Um, so besides the weird, 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 weird wording of this theory, um, I can kind of see it. Well, what we know about sharks, especially great, great, great white sharks, is that they migrate. So they don't stay in one place forever. They're not all, you know, in one body of water. They're everywhere. So it's very, very likely, is the word I'm looking for, that they have come across dolphins, humans you know, different sea creatures, you know, they migrate. So it makes sense. And I'm pretty sure hammerhead sharks and mako sharks are the same. They migrate, but I know for a fact great white sharks migrate a lot. That part of the theory is very um, likely. Um, the part about the vegetarianism being that humans are the enemies and not fish, which I get could be true, but it's not like these sharks are out hunting humans that we know of. But, you know, I don't know. I just, this one is like hard to wrap my head around because it's worded so oddly. Um, But I mean, yeah, these sharks could have been traumatized by humans. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I really don't see how that correlates to fish being friends and not food. Um, when they could eat fish and humans. So, I don't know. This theory is confusing to me. The next theory. In Finding Nemo, Marlin is transitioning into a female clownfish. During the movie Finding Nemo, Marlin is transi transitioning into a female clownfish. Clownfish are protodangerous hermaphrodites. All individuals are born male and then transition into a female, female at some point in their life. Clownfish groups are organized into dominance, hi dominance hierarchies where the highest ranking individual is the only female in the group and the remaining members are all males. The second highest ranking individual is the breeding male. When the female dies or leaves the group, the breeding male will switch genders and become the dominant female. Over the course of the movie, we see Marlin begin to transition into a dominant female clownfish. In the beginning of Finding Nemo, Coral dies leaving Marlin as the highest ranking individual in his sea anemone. 
Marlon is very paranoid and cautious at this point in the movie. These are traits that correlate with male subordinate cl clownfish. As the movie goes on, Marlon becomes more relaxed and confident with himself. These are traits that correlate with the behavior of dominant individuals in dominance-based social hierarchies. At the end of the movie, Marlon is in the final phases of his gender, gender transition. Um, so I don't know much about clownfish, so I don't know how much of this I can actually say, but if that's true, which I'm sure this person didn't make it up, um, it's something I've never noticed for sure. Um, I thought he just got calmer throughout the movie because he got Nemo back and all of that, but... I don't know. Maybe it was because he was turning into the dominant female. Hmm. Interesting. The one to blame for most of the events of Finding Nemo is Mr. Ray. I'm seeing the events that happen after Nemo's first day of school. Mr. Ray is a spotted eagle ray, a species of ray that, thought not aggressive, caused pain with their sting. They are also predators, the majority of their diet consists of gastropods, mollusks, and crabs, while also eating shrimps, octopus, worms, and small fish. When Nemo arrives at the Sydney fish tank after being captured, P. Sherman, aka the dentist, says that he found Nemo struggling for life out on the reef. It could mean by Nemo's bad swimming, but also because Mr. Ray was nearby and P. Sherman may have thought that Mr. Ray was attacking Nemo and the other fish. While taking Nemo, that one other diver that took a picture of Marlin may have tried to capture Mr. Ray, but he ran off with the other fish kids. So basically, the majority of events on Finding Nemo were indirectly Mr. Ray's fault. I don't know about that. I think the events of Finding Nemo are humans' faults. I don't think Mr. Ray is at fault here. The school scene secretly displays the gruesome nature of ocean life. Something that's always bothered me about Finding Nemo is that in the opening scene, we see Marlin and insert ladyfish name here, I'm guessing they're talking about coral, discuss their excitement about being parents. They have hundreds and hundreds of eggs due to hatch any day now. However, fate intervenes and mommy and all eggs minus one become supper for a hungry barracuda. Cut to Nemo's first day at school, so exciting. Notice that there seemed to only be one of each type of fish, but we do see at least one instance of a parent dropping off multiple fish. Given what we know from the movie and basic marine biology is that fish hatch many at a time. This leads me to believe that what happened to Marlin and Nemo at the beginning of the movie isn't rare, not even frequent, it's actually the norm. You have a bunch of kids, but by the time they're of school age, most have been eaten by predators. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I just, I, I think either they get eaten by predators or I know a lot of species do like, like sharks will have like survival of the fittest. Like whoever comes out on top is born kind of thing. Um, and it also like depends on the species of animal. Because, like, when you think of the seahorse, I don't know how many seahorses are born at one time. And same with, like, octopuses. So, I don't know. It, that's an interesting... I mean, it very well could be the norm. Okay, this is an alternative theory. Coral and the others aren't actually killed. Marlin and Coral didn't actually meet the way Marlin describes. They actually met because... Coral was a prostitute and Marlin was a client. Marlin becomes a regular and accidentally gets Coral pregnant and Coral decides to leave the life to be with Marlin because she knows he can have give her a better life. So Coral runs out on her pimp, the Barracuda, who is not too happy about losing his best bitch, so he searches for her. <laughs> the Barracuda finds Coral and Marlin on the reef just as they're moving into their new anemone home which Marlin hopes is good enough to please Coral, so she sticks around. So Mr. Pimpacuda shows up and pimp slaps Marlin, and while Marlin is un unconscious, he abducts 
abducts Coral and the kids but leaves Nemo because he notices that Nemo has some damage to his egg and assumes he'll die anyway. So Marlin wakes up and saves Nemo and the story begins as we know, except the dentist abducts Nemo a short time later on orders from his notorious niece, Darla, who is more than just a, a rambunctious toddler. She's actually the ruthless leader of an underground fish tank sweat camp and the barracudas and the dentist are actually her enforcers who capture and collect fish from the ocean for slave labor. Cleaning algae and scum from fish tanks she offers to high-end clients and the picture of her with a dead fish in a bag is a warning for the new recruits being held in the dentist's office awaiting transfer to their work site. Finding Nemo isn't about literally finding Nemo, it's about Nemo finding himself and in turn helping every fish in themselves and finding freedom. What were you smoking? <laughs> Honestly, what were you smoking when you came up with that theory? You had to be on something. Like, there's no way you just came up with that completely sober. Huh. I don't have anything else to say to that. Okay, we're switching over to Finding Dory. Um, I have two Finding Dory theories. The subtle clues to what happened to Hank. So Hank the Septipus is terrified of being released back into the open ocean, claiming that he had a terrible experience out there. We also know that he lost a tentacle, leading to him being a septipus instead of an octopus. Later in the film, Hank is eating animal crackers and tosses one cracker away uneaten, a shark. My theory is that the reason Hank is being rehabilitated in the Institute and fears going back into the ocean is that he was attacked by a shark and lost a tentacle in the encounter. That's very, 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 very possible. Makes, makes the most sense, to be quite honest. And the next one is um, also about how Hank lost his tentacle. The first hint you should have clinched onto while watching this, when he asked Dory for her tack. There's a subtle contradiction here. Why didn't he just let himself be found and subsequently tagged? There's a 75% chance, given how hard other employees look for him, that he's already on the list to go to Cleveland. Simple. He's scared of a human tagging him since the last time someone did, the cutting tool accidentally clipped off his tentacle, which is also why he can't go back in the ocean. He's used to the company of humans, so he will be tempted near the Institute, ergo get caught and tagged. His aversion to kids hint towards either a distracted parent bringing their child to work or a trainee being responsible for the unfortunate detachment. Um, while I think that's a good theory, I think the other one about the shark is probably better. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's all I have for this video. If you want to read over the theories from this video on your own, the link is in the description. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.